Well, there we are, Greg J. How are you today? Good morning. Coffee Conversations with Greg J is on. Yep, yep, yep. Hey, what a great show we have today. Um, you know, hopefully you're doing okay. Hopefully you're staying safe. Hopefully you're keeping your head up in these days and time. What a great show today. We got our lens on the uh international scene. We're going all over, all the way over there live from Johannesburg, trying to get it all connected right now, even as we speak, checking all of our systems, making sure all systems are go here at the Dream Creator Studio. You know where we are, East Village Arts District, Long Beach. <laughs> but reaching across the globe live from Johannesburg, and, you know, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news. I just believe that we ought to have a global perspective. Yes, we want to pay attention to what's going on here in our communities, right? But we also want to make sure that we are, um, you know, connected with the diaspora. What's going on all across the world uh, where we are, you know, our systems, our situations, our governments, we're in control. You know, you want to keep that your eye on what's going on. Your perspective ought to be global in these days and time, especially in the days of the Internet. Right. We've been watching what's going on over in Haiti. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Monica Kleska come on to give us a perspective of what was going on there in the wake of the assassination of their president. Uh, we've been uh, keeping up with what's going on in South Africa. Uh, what's going on in Cuba? What's going on in St. Lucia? One of your favorite vacation spots, I bet. You know, they had presidential elections and for the first time, an independent has uh, won the election there and now will be the prime minister. More on that later, but check your global headlines. Our friends over in South Africa are really experiencing uh, a, a challenging time. And uh, I, I am not South African. I have been there many, many times. I've just developed many, many relationships over there. Got a lot of good friends over there. I speak to people in the nation of South Africa quite regularly, several times a week, and uh, keep up with what's going on as a broadcaster. A lot of those are our journalists, our broadcasters, people who, you know, have an objective observance position. Uh, of what's going on there in the life and times of Southern Africa. You know, I mean, that's a really good position to be in. When I read the headlines of my morning news, I always look over to see what's going on there. I look what's going on in Kenya. I look what's going on all over the continent. But South Africa is near and dear to my heart, man. I mean, I've, I've developed a lot, a lot of good friends over there. We've hosted so many uh, cultural exchanges here in the United States with South African broadcasters. You know, uh, just a level of observance, of community observance, uh, walking step by step with our brothers and sisters over there. Today we said, man, crisis of the people. Somebody texted me and said, what do you mean? You know, well, you know, democracy is... Uh, by the people, for the people, for the people, by the people. Uh, we watched over in South Africa, they jailed their former president. Basically contempt of court, probably a little bit more to that. People took to the streets, looting, violence. A lot of people died in that unrest, you know, very, very tragic. It hurts my heart because I love the country so much over there. But then when we sit back and we analyze it, you know, Martin Luther King says, hey, a riot is the language of the unheard. So, you know, the people are feeling that they're not being heard, I suppose. You know, we know what that's like. We took into the streets here. But let's get a perspective there, all the way live from Johannesburg. A good friend. I was watching her newscast, yo. She's a baller. <laughs> National news, man. 
You know, I mean, this is really good. I'm so proud of her. Miss Tommy Ingubaini joins us this morning. Hi, Tommy. How are you? I'm awesome, Greg. How are you doing? You're doing all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> so awesome. good to see you. So good to see you. And wow, you know, I'm watching you on the news and you are uh, really, really... Man, I mean, you know, you want your, your newscasters to be, you know, believable and trustworthy. And you are definitely that. You're coming across oh. quite well on the airwaves. And I really, really love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. So much appreciated. Much yes, appreciated. yes. All right. So, Tommy, you know, you've known me a long time. And you, mm -hmm. you heard me say I love the country of South Africa. And I know you can attest to that. You know, I've been over there many, many times. I just love what the nation has stood for in these uh, post-apartheid years. Uh, the the hope, right? The hope was always what was very attractive to me. Now I'm watching, you know, man, a lot going on over there. Uh, you know, a lot going on in these United States. But if I look at my brothers and sisters in South Africa, there's a lot going on there. Let's start there. Let's talk about the pandemic. You know, I was thinking about, and I want to start there because I was thinking about it this morning because when I turned on the morning news here in the States, first thing they're talking about is, okay, people aren't vaccinated, so they're causing a, a resurgence of the pandemic, and the one lady called it a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And uh, mm -hmm. I see this Delta variant that they're talking about over here is uh, ravaging, you know, South Africa. What's going on in terms of the pandemic there? Are you guys on back on lockdown or what's really going yeah. on? Well, we, we have been on, on lockdown. Uh, we actually just had a reduction of the lockdown yesterday um, uh, on, on Sunday, two days mm -hmm. ago. Uh, the president went on and now we are at a reduced lockdown level. Um, but it seems to be, I mean, for the longest time, it looked like the vaccination process was behind schedule. Um, the uh, targeted number of people to be vaccinated per day uh, was not being reached. But there seems to be an uptake now in, in the number of, of people who are being vaccinated uh, in the country. So that seems to be quite positive. Uh, the age group that's aged between 35 um, and 49, they started uh, vaccinating um, about a month or so ago. And, and they've been very positive and there's been a huge uptake. Um, the, the younger uh, ones uh, from the teens up will be uh, vaccinating in, in about a month or so's time. So that vaccination process is you know, currently underway, but the Delta variant, I, I think, um, threw a huge curveball for South Africa. It wasn't quite expected before the Delta variant was prevalent. It was the, the Beta variant, and that one seemed to be pretty much under control. And then there were questions of whether Johnson & Johnson was actually effective uh, with the, the Delta variant, and it's found to be effective as well. So the two main vaccines that South Africa is using at the moment is a Pfizer as well as um, as Johnson & Johnson, but there's also been uh, approval of uh, of Sinovac, except uh, rollout for that hasn't yet started. Still a few more tests that have to be done uh, with the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, but in principle it has been approved. But there is call as well for the Russian vaccine Sputnik uh, to be approved. So processes as well and applications are underway uh, for, for that one. But I must say that the vaccination process is picking up. Uh, teachers as well have been uh, vaccinated. They've got an over 90% uh, rate of, of teachers who are agreeable uh, to, to being vaccinated. Obviously, we know that all our healthcare workers, at least those who wanted to take that vaccine, uh, did that. They were the first frontline workers to do so. Uh, journalists have also now uh, op opened up, and as well as the various age groups that uh, I mentioned a bit earlier on. So there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel as far as the vaccination process is, is concerned, and and certainly not the type of um, you know numbers that we were seeing uh, earlier on. So th there's light and hope in that regard. You know that's markedly different from how we're hearing it here in the United States, and that's you know that's always the case, which is why I love to be able to reach out across and get the real story, because they make it sound like it's you know South Africa is just like it's just the it, the, the pandemic is just out of control, and that's the that's the tone that you hear from the news here. Yeah, well, look, it's it's serious, Greg. I mean, I don't think anyone can say it's not serious. It certainly mm -hmm. is serious. But um, 
not to those catastrophic levels of, of reporting that you might uh, be getting on that side. It, you know, it seems mm -hmm. like there is a level of control that that, that is being achieved um, on, on that side, although there's been a lot of uh, criticism as well um, of, of government. And the main criticism, though, comes in, first of all, the slow pace with which they seem to react right at the beginning of the pandemic. And you'll remember our history with the vaccines. Our first port of call and vaccine of choice as a country was AstraZeneca. And mm -hmm. AstraZeneca was brought into the country. There was the issue of uh, potential expiry dates for AstraZeneca. And then it was found that the beta variant uh, was not going to be, uh, or rather AstraZeneca was not going to be efficient uh, with the, the beta variant at the time, which is the variant that was discovered. And therefore mm -hmm. all those AstraZeneca vaccines literally had to be, you know, gotten rid of, and and um, you know, some were sent back to uh, the the Serum Institute in, in in India. Others were sent to 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 other countries. But our first batch of vaccines that was supposed to be the start of the process could not be used because the beta variant became a dominant after the the, the initial strain. Um, mm. And so we started off on on a back foot, and then government introduced um, the the different lockdown levels, lockdown level five, which is the highest one. That was catastrophic for businesses because businesses had to close down, people couldn't go to work, we had to stay at home, uh, restaurants were closed, and for a, 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 an extended period of time, there was no economic activity. So that also uh, just perpetuates um, the, the situation. A government did put some relief um, measures in place, like social, uh, social relief of distress grants, which was a grant given to all those who um, are unemployed, who are not earning a living, and that amount of money was supposed to help them at least be able to, you know, take care of their daily needs. Uh, mm -hmm. There was the um, unemployment uh, fund, the TERS, for all those who were working, uh, had jobs, but could not go, be, go to those jobs. There were measures put in place for, for businesses and small businesses, although uh, a large number of businesses are saying that there was so much red tape around accessing those funds access was a problem so in as much as the facilities were said to be made available you remember that we also got some loans uh, from from the imfs etc so even though the the facilities were there uh, some business people were saying they were not able to access all of those facilities so we've had our fair share of, of challenges we certainly have so um, i don't want to underplay the situation at all but I also would not say that there are dead bodies everywhere because that's not the case. Um, Some, somebody on here, I know, I know there's a business person or someone listening to this podcast right now who say, wow, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Lots of red tape with the social, with the relief grants and all of the efforts that the government is trying to do to make financial uh, cushions for us. Uh, lots of red tape, lots of confusion. To, Boy, uh, you know, we look, try to go get through to the unemployment people at the EDD. Forget about it. It's really, really stressful for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it certainly is. And and that just exacerbates an already uh, existing position and situation of poverty in the country. You'll know that we have some of the highest, you know, poverty and, and inequality rates uh, mm -hmm. in South Africa. So this has not helped the situation. It's exacerbated it. And I mm -hmm. want to go back, uh, Greg, if I may, you, you may want to talk sure. about this a bit later on, but I, I want to go back to your opening statement there about the backdrop that existed when former President Jacob Zuma uh, was incarcerated. Uh, he's gotten a jail term of 15 months for mm -hmm. contempt of court. And if they just put that in, into perspective uh, for one moment, mm -hmm. when he was convicted of contempt of court, you'll know that we've got the a state capital commission of inquiry uh, that's currently underway and that basically is to uproot and to discover the causes of, of corruption uh, within government and also within business so the relationship with state-owned entities and private enterprises um, you know has there been money laundering has there been mismanagement of funds uh, have uh, you know contracts been unawarded unduly what has happened to all of the money that was supposed to be used by state-owned entities uh, and, and business was supposed to be done. So that has been ongoing. And so the situation here is this particular State Capture Commission of Inquiry was actually assigned off by former President Jacob Zuma himself 
under duress, one must admit, but he signed it off nonetheless for this investigation and for this commission to take place. So we were at the point now where former President Jacob Zuma was to appear before the State Capture Commission of Inquiry, which was led by um, the Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. He did appear before the commission, um, but changed his tune somewhere along the lines, saying that he will no longer appear before the commission because the Deputy Chief Justice is biased towards him and will not give him a fair hearing and a fair trial. So the former mm. president said, only if you, Deputy Chief Justice, recuse yourself from uh, the, the hearing will I then participate. That was not to be. He um, did not substantiate reasons that were credible enough, I guess, in, in the eyes of, of, of the law. He actually didn't even go and defend um, his case when he was called to, to do so. And so the legal processes that were there to be followed to uh, apply for the recusal um, you know, of, of the judge did not, um, did, did not materialize. Um, he did not go through. He was summoned to go through to the State Capture Commission of Inquiry um, uh, by the uh, Supreme Court eventually, and he did not go even after that summons. And so that is where the contempt of court uh, you know, case comes in. And even when he was to appear before the Supreme Court of Inquiry, he did not appear before the courts. So the Supreme Court found itself, as they say, in a position where they had been undermined, according to them, by the former president and had to then uh, you know, sentence him to 15 months. And that was actually a first time for a constitutional court uh, because usually it would be you know, uh, taken to a lower court in order for the lower court to basically hand out the sentencing, which can then also be appealed. But once the ruling comes from the constitutional court, that cannot be appealed. And so that's where the former president, Jacob Zuma, found himself 15 months uh, behind bars. And when that happened, then there were some quarters and some of his supporters who said that will not happen. And when it does, they are going to basically destabilize the country and they are going to uh, advocate for his release. And first of all, to prevent him from going to prison. And after then, he was in prison to then advocate for his release. So that break is the backdrop and the better of the, the backstory in, in brushstrokes of, of what it is that has led us to of where we are right now. So following the incarceration of former President Jacob Zuma, we then started seeing the rioting um, and the looting happening in Wazulu Natal, which is a province in South Africa, it's like a state, if, if you wish, mm -hmm. um, in South Africa. That is where the former president has his stronghold. That is where he is from. Shops were being looted there, businesses were being looted, and that then also spread to Johannesburg. So those are the two uh, main hubs where the violence was experienced, where um, the, the looting uh, was experienced, and where the, the killings were experienced. Over 330 people have died um, in, the, in the last two weeks. This happened uh, two weeks ago. And so a large number of lives uh, were lost, and uh, police really did not have much control of, of the situation. And in many ways, as I was watching, because I, I was literally on air as this was happening, as the looting was happening, I remember one moment specifically when Jabulani Mall in Soweto um, was, was being looted. Now, Jabulani Mall is across the road from a police station. So the oh. looting was taking place across the road from a police station. There were uh, police uh, officers there with their guns. Um, whatever shots were being fired were rubber bullets that were being fired you know, in the air. And it really looked like they were they were they were unlooking. They were trying to control the crowds, but but there were more spectators more than anything else. I don't know if you can remember June the sixth for yourselves when when Capitol Hill was stormed. Yes, it looked like the police were doing nothing. As yes, an onlooker, as an onlooker, you say this is a very different uh, crowd control measure that has not really been seen before. The police are usually very active. They're very proactive. They will. You know, fire the rubber bullets, they will go into the crowds, they will use crowd control measures, whether it's water cannons or it's tear gas, whatever the case may be. Uh, but this, these were used very sparingly um, in, in a lot of, of the places. So I think a lot of the, the deaths that transpired were not deaths due to uh, police violence from 
an observer's perspective, uh, mm -hmm. but a lot of deaths that were due to the looting, a lot of stampeding, um, mm. and uh, you know, shots being fired here and there from rubber bullets in, in some instances. But a large part of it was really from the pandemonium of the moment and the rush. People, mm. Greg, were walking out with beds. They were walking out with fridges. They were walking out with washing machines. They were walking out with trolleys filled with food, meat, tin stuff, clothes. Right. Um, it, it really was a sight to behold. It. And mm. every now and then, police would try to, to intervene and try and control the crowd. But it was quite clear that, and this is something that the president admitted as well, that they were not ready for, um, you know, for such an, such an event. Um, and it really did show a weakness in, in, in the structure of, of, of policing. Uh, mm. But the Minister of Police did come out and say the methods of crowd control, even though they were overwhelmed by the crowd, were actually very intentional. They were not trying to uh, create another Maritana where um, you know, citizens would be killed. <laughs> and there are two main narratives that have come out of this. One is an acknowledgement that this started first and foremost as a sign of protest against the incarceration of former President Jacob Zuma. But there are other elements that have creeped in post that. So while the flame was started by the imprisonment, it was actually spread and exacerbated by the underlying conditions of poverty and inequality. And this became clear when our, our journalists on the ground were talking to the looters and talking to the various community members, because some of them would say, I'm just hungry. I just mm -hmm. want food. I want to feed my family. I need clothes. And that's why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you, it became quite clear that the instigators were for political motives, but there are other bigger social economic drivers that really were the impetus and the groundswell for what mm -hmm. we experienced in, in, in the past two weeks. Mm. Wow, that's very interesting. So this is, <laughs> I mean, there's so much to, to chew on there. I mean, um, I guess the first question, I wanna, I wanna kind of go back to the political motive. Would you describe this as an insurrection or just straight, out of control rioting was this insurrection because it's almost similar to january 6 right we're we're calling it some of us are saying that's an insurrection others are saying well it's just their freedom to protest it depends on who you're talking to mm. the president of the country says it was a failed insurrection it was a failed coup. Mm -hmm. um the minister of defense uh says it, it really wasn't um, a, a failed uh, insurrection uh, or coup. There wasn't really um, any threat to the, the, the state. The intention, because when you talk about a coup and you talk about an intention uh, or an insurrection, the intention is to topple government. Mm -hmm. So was this an attempt to remove government? Only the African National Congress perhaps can, can answer that. Mm -hmm. um, or was it an attempt to destabilize the country in order to, you know, get the former president out? Uh, only the African National Congress can, you know, can answer that. They are alluding that it may be an internal ANC matter because there are factions and divisions within the party, mm -hmm. uh, as is seen in many political parties around the world, uh, as it has seen even within the Republicans, where it's one party, but there are, are different, I guess, ideologies, yes. uh, you know, different, um, you know, uh, people that you're supporting within, within the one party, and that exists uh, within the African National Congress. Mm. And so what intelligence has been saying is that they have found um, some sort of communication, whether it's SMSs, etc., in mm -hmm. groups within the, the, the African National Congress that are pro- uh, former President uh, Jacob Zuma, and in these groups, this is when they spoke about the, the uh, you know, the, the attempts to destabilize and the plans to destabilize the country in order to get the former president out. So mm -hmm. I guess the debate is still out there. Was this mm -hmm. an, a failed insurrection? Was it a coup? Was it an attempt to try and uh, get former President Jacob Zuma out? Or did it end up really being 
the cry of the people on the ground um, and a show of the really deep levels of inequality and poverty um, that exist. Investigations are still underway. There are some 12 arrests that they said they've made or 12 names that intelligence says that they have and investigations are still underway um, regarding that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One begets the other, though, because while they're fighting and squabbling in those high places, you know, it still always, always, always comes down to the people. And uh, what you're saying is so now that rips the covers off the real conditions out here uh, on the streets, you know, people are hungry. You know, we've been in this pandemic man. I can't go to work. My money is funny. I got to get out here and do my thing. I yeah. mean, Greg, if, if you look at our unemployment rate, it's sitting at 43.2%. That's the expanded definition wow. for unemployment in the country. And when we look at the youth, that's sitting at 46.3% unemployment. So the unemployment rate is, is extremely high. Mm -hmm. It's extremely mm -hmm. high. And that obviously, uh, those are obviously the circumstances that lead to poverty. There's mm -hmm. a huge middle-class black, um, you know, a society that that's coming up but the gap between the haves and the have-nots is so huge and it continues to grow so mm -hmm. you find that the divide now is perhaps no it's not so much across racial lines but across uh, wealth lines and, and opportunity mm -hmm. lines so those are the kind of dynamics that we that we are finding ourselves in now and and mm -hmm. i just mentioned race here and if i may in phoenix which is a, a part of wasabi natal uh, in, in, which is where the uh, rioting took place along as uh, Hao Ding. There were also instances where the, the shop owners in that particular area, Phoenix, uh, which basically has a large number of people of Indian origin living in that particular area, took to protecting the malls there. Um, and in that effort of protection, they basically you know, started kicking people out who were of color, black people, and not allowing them in. Uh, some of them were beaten. Uh, some were, were even killed at this point. And so wow. it started off as a community trying to, quote unquote, protect their assets and protect their businesses, ended up being uh, basically a killing along racial lines and segregation along racial lines between Indians and blacks. So that is yet another dynamic. Um, that's resurfacing. It's nothing new. Those dynamics were there, but uh, for the longest period of time, there was a bit of a lull as race relations seemed to be mending in those quarters. But mm. you know, those those flames were always burning underneath, and an incident like this brought them up to the fore. So just um, yesterday, actually, uh, the suspects that have been nabbed appeared in the magistrate court. Um, for the, the first part of, um, of the, the, the legal processes. The parade is still to, to happen. The identities are not yet known because the parade hasn't yet happened. But we're finding ourselves also having to deal um, with issues of, of race relations in, in, the, in the country right now. Interesting, you know, and, and um, very reminiscent of 1992 when the, uh, yes, we took to the streets because the police had beaten Rodney King However, it really uncovered, you know, the, the, the race relations between the Koreans and the black people and the same, the same type of situation there. Uh, so I, I guess it begs the question, just like in 92, we have to ask ourselves as black people, how do we regain our economic or bolster our economic footing in our own communities as opposed to letting people from you know well other, other countries <laughs> come and, and establish businesses and now they're basically ruling the economics of the area thereby we're just we're still becoming a consumer class and we're slaves if you will to their you know, cause we have to go to their stores to buy our goods. How do, what is being done in South Africa to encourage economic development among black people? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it's important, uh, Greg, I, I believe that the economy should be open, uh, you know, to people from different um, countries, yes. uh, to South Africans, to African people. Uh, but because we are the majority in this country, opportunities 
really should be going to the majority of, of black South Africans. We are the majority, the numbers are here, um, mm -hmm. and we are the historically marginalized uh, mm -hmm. group, which is why policies uh, that, the, that the government put in place like black economic empowerment, known as BE or broad-based black economic empowerment, which is why policies like those were put in place to introduce the previously marginalized black people into mainstream business and into big business. So if you look at black economic empowerment, what it really has managed to do is to create a middle class of black South Africans who mm. are doing extremely well. It has benefited those who are politically linked to the, the right leadership mm. and the right parties and the right people. So it's really taken and, and created the cream at the top while the rest mm. of South African society is at the bottom and not benefiting much from this black economic empowerment. Another uh, huge initiative that's been put in place is what's called um, the township economy. And, and mm. you, you know what a township is, Greg, you've been to, mm. to South Africa. And mm. basically the, the townships is where um, people of African origin, black people historically lived. Maybe you'd call it the projects, right? In, in right. The, the, that, that would be your equivalent of, of the townships. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea there is to make sure that township economy is first of all established, it is supported and it thrives so that it's not just the big multinational companies that are coming into the townships and the uh, consumers are the black people in those townships, but that they actually have ownership and stakes within uh, the township economy. So those are some of the efforts that are, are being put into place. Um, and how successful they are is still quite debatable, especially as far as um, the, the township economy. It's a great phrase, it's a great slogan, great intentions, but I, I, I believe that a whole lot more can be done to actually make sure that you know, black, profession, uh, black professionals, black business people are capacitated and educated as well to be able to, to run and to build uh, big businesses. And, and, and so government has to set that structure. It's not the role of government really to you know, create business, but it really is the, the role of government to create an environment and, and a landscape where business can be created and where business can thrive. So government policy needs to support, support mm -hmm. that. Um, there are also talks now about the, the kind of austerity measures that our you know, Ministry of, of, of Finance has, has put in place, mm -hmm. where making sure that austerity measures are, are, are practiced, salaries uh, are being cut down. For example, public sector workers, no increase um, for them. Uh, a lot of the budgets have been cut down, whether it's in education, whether it's in social development, uh, whether it's in infrastructure. And, and so some economists are questioning that austerity approach. And they're saying that in order to be able to stimulate an economy, you need to have money circulating within that economy. Mm. And, and, and so there are a lot of policies that I believe can be relooked um, in order to, to make sure that they, they do facilitate an environment where businesses um, can thrive and, and individuals can start living above the, the poverty line, especially those who are marginalized and who are at the bottom of the run um, economically. So, you know, are the jobs only in the cities? And I know there's this a tremendous frontier, you know, and it's always been fascinating to me to have my friends who are professionals and yeah, they live out there in Joburg and they're living the cosmopolitan, or what do they say, the Afropolitan life, you know, and yeah. all of that. <laughs> but then they'll say, oh, I've got to go to the village. And that yeah. is always like, you know, that's, a, you know, it's a thing, you know, auntie and them are still out, out in the frontier somewhere, you know, and I got to go to the village and, and do my thing and become traditional because that's who I am. Now, out in the, out in the village, our jobs there, does it, how does the economy thrive out in the, in the rural areas? Economy in the rural areas does not thrive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. If we can remember how cities um, and metropolitan hubs in, in, in South Africa really came to be, um, like, for example, Gauteng, which is a province that stands for the city of gold. Mm -hmm. That's because, you know, gold was discovered in, in, in Gauteng 
And so the conglomerates had to get cheap black labor. And the place to get that cheap black labor is from the homelands, you know, mm -hmm. the rural areas that you're talking about. So uh, there was a migration from the homelands to the cities where work was. A lot of people initially came here to work on, on the mines. That's just the history of the migration of our, our people and, and where we come from. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, those are the structures that have created um, that have created our cities. And so you'll find that rural areas are still very much underdeveloped. Uh, you'll find that some of the mining towns even are still underdeveloped. And so if you want to have a shot at life, you still have to leave the home um, where your ancestors are probably from, or where your grand or great parents are still there. Mm -hmm. You'll go back on holidays, um, carrying a whole bunch of uh, plastics with groceries for Christmas and um, you know clothes for all the kids in, in the family that still live there. Um, and, and so that's basically just how, how the, the society is structured. Mm -hmm. uh, so rural development is also uh, what government says is a key concern uh, for them and a key uh, initiative and driver because you know one has got to capacitate the, the urban areas and and try to declutter the, the saturation here by creating industry there um, but it's a long way off mm -hmm. it's a long way off and one of the key uh, drivers and and, and measures that can be used to actually stimulate economic growth in the rural areas is um, not so much industrial development, but more agrarian reform, agriculture, um, which takes us then to the issue of land and land distribution, which is still very key and a very topical heated issue uh, for, for black South Africans, that the land that was taken away, you know, from, from them and their ancestral families be reinstated to them. Uh, so that is something that's very key for the economic freedom fighters, one of the um, the opposition parties in South Africa. It's something that uh, the ANC has also uh, drafted as, as part of, of the policy, land distribution uh, without compensation. And beforehand, there was compensation for the farmers that had been on that land. Um, so that's still a, a policy that is, is still being ironed out and still needs to be implemented and still needs to be rolled out in, on a much bigger frame. But for rural communities, it's not about turning them into many cities, but it's about using what's already there, which is land, uh, using um, a, a sector that's already burgeoning there, which is agriculture, but making sure that the owners of the land are the black people of the land who also work the land and can then benefit from the land and who at the age of retirement will not be kicked out uh, by the, the white landowner because they are of no service to them anymore and then the younger crop, crop of workers and the younger crop of families comes in so those are mm. just some of the dynamics that still need to um, to shift and an effort is being made in in that direction too yeah i've been at the table when uh, some of the white folks were talking about that very issue and they were furious you know oh, we're not going to give back our land and, and at the same time I, I always laugh about this story so a friend of mine i, I ended up meeting their their family and uh, i came back to the states i started getting these pictures of cattle from my friend's brother and I'm looking at these cattle and I'm like, okay, what, you know? And he's trying to get me to go into business with him because he lives out in, um, oh, I can't remember the, the province he lives. Anyway, he's out, in the, he's out in the rural areas. So he's telling me that we can make all of these, this money raising cattle because, you know, we're going to be selling them. There's traditional purposes. There's people who are using the cattle for the bowl. He's like really breaking it down. And I'm, I yeah. started thinking about it. I was like, and then he said, oh, you can buy your house. You know, he, the chief will give you land and you can buy your house. And he's sending me plans of a home out there and everything. And I, I was like, wow, you know, this is really serious business right here for him, you know, and it was, it was pretty, pretty deep. Now, uh, I, I want to get to Julius Malema because I watched a speech for him yesterday as he made a kind of a response. And, and I guess I gathered it was one of his first appearances since all of this stuff has happened. I will say I tried to get him on Coffee Conversations because his 
he became in our in America. We, as you know, we've had our social unrest since since George the murder of George Floyd. His speeches have becoming started to become really popular here, and I was like, "Ooh, I, I need to get him." Uh oh, lost her. I need to get him on the um, you know on coffee conversations. But Julius Malema is. He is not biting his tongue about taking the land from the the white farmers and giving it back to the people. He's very upfront about it. Uh, we lost Tamia there, uh, global connection. Let's see if she kind of gets back to us so that we can um, continue this fascinating conversation. You know, the dynamics in Southern Africa are really, really something. The, and, and you can see the parallels, right? You can see the parallels of what's happening here. Um, uh, just a little different. One of the things I do want to ask her, which is what I was getting at as we brought up Julius Malema. So the ANC is the African National Congress. That's the party of Mandela, right? This is the party that is largely credited with uh, overthrowing the apartheid regime and here she is right here back all right there you are so tommy i wanted to ask you so and when we think about can you hear me uh oh I don't think so. okay can okay. you hear me now right now i can see you moving except i can't hear you you can't hear me Okay, okay. That'd be good. there we go. All right, very good. So, Tommy, I wanted to ask you as we were talking about Julius Malema while you were away, we were I was explaining the difference between um, the EFF and the um, ANC, the EFF being the Economic Freedom Fighters. And uh, Julius got a little he got a little popular during our, our intense, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and, and everything. Uh, and it's I guess now, you know, ANC being the party of Mandela, everybody, the majority is the ANC, but now you have a new generation that's saying, hmm, maybe the EFF is the way to go. Do you see a lot of people starting to turn away from the uh, ANC or actually reconsider their political alignments? You know, the, the ANC is still very much um, the, the leading party but the type of support that they enjoy now is mm -hmm. a far cry from what they enjoyed in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just evident in, in the votes um, and in the fact that in some places they've got to form a coalition, you know, um, local municipalities and local governments, while, you know, beforehand they would probably be able to have a majority as the African National Congress. And now, they're forced to form, you know, coalition governments and municipalities um, with, with, with different parties. And mm -hmm. so we can definitely see a decline. They don't have that, that over 50% majority that they used to enjoy before. Uh, they are still the largest party in South Africa, followed by um, the uh, premier opposition, uh, the Democratic Alliance, uh, or rather the first opposition, the second largest opposition and mm -hmm. then followed then by the Economic Freedom Fighters, the EFF. Uh, mm -hmm. So those basically, I think it's one could comfortably say are the three um, you know, biggest parties in South Africa right now. And the history of Julius Malema is, is, is quite interesting uh, because he's a former, uh, a former leader of the African National Congress Youth League. Mm -hmm. He uh, was very close to uh, former President Jacob Zuma um, at some point, he even said that, you know, he will do anything for the former president. That has, um, you know, since changed. But he did leave um, the African National Congress, uh, left the, and uh, was no longer president of, of the Youth League. And following that, then formed his own party, which is now the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters. That speech that you were listening to the other day was probably, uh, it must have been Monday, right? That yes. Was eight, yeah, that was the eighth year celebration address uh, by Julius Malema. So his policies and the policies of the party are very Marxist and uh, Leninist policies, uh, very much for a black empowerment, uh, very much for economic freedom, very much for land uh, redistribution, um, you know, and an end to any sort of, um, you know, racial segregation, 
in the sense of black people being marginalized due to issues of, of race, etc. So um, that's where they are. And uh, they don't really mince their words or, or dilute uh, what they stand for. That's well. right. Uh, and, and you'll remember that Julius Malema was like a son to for the late Mamouini Madikizela Mandela. So um, if, if one wants to use the word, um, you know, radical uh, and, and um, non-compromising, that is, is, is where perhaps you, you, would, you would put them. But they have increasingly been doing well uh, in, in the elections. The, the number of voters have increased with each election that they've had. Uh, there have only been two elections that they were part of. Um, they've also getting more local municipalities. Um, a lot of young people are gravitating towards the, the EFF. And as you mentioned earlier on in our, in our conversation, corruption is a big problem. Uh, corruption coupled with unaccountability is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And it takes me back to some of the commentary that we heard during the looting, where as people, the poor were looting the businesses and the shops, some of the rhetoric that they were saying is, well, if the leaders of, of the country uh, can loot huge business amounts with big business and not be held accountable, this looting that we're doing is, is nothing. It pales in comparison to the real looting that is taking place, uh, which is what the State Capture Commission of Inquiry is really um, all about. It's to mm -hmm. unravel and to discover all the irregular uh, business dealings and all the irregular flows of money from states to businesses mm. and also at times from businesses to certain individuals um, with power and, and influence in, in government. So what we really were seeing with the looting is perhaps a microcosm and even a reflection of um, what is happening in the upper echelons. And mm. that's also the ticket that the EFF themselves um, have been have been pushing, uh, mm. wanting accountability. Uh, they are even now um, and have been advocating for the CR17 uh, bank statements, which is the CR17 is the Cyril Ramaphosa uh, uh, campaign that he ran when he was running for president of the African National Congress. They're wanting those bank statements to be made public so that South Africans can see if there are any kickbacks or if there are any benefits that those who have supported the now president's uh, election campaign within the African National Congress, if they've benefited in any undue way, uh, mm. because you can sponsor a candidate you know, for a particular role in, in leadership, but if you then are going to be forging a way for yourself to get business deals at the end of that, then that is ir irregular. So that's part of what they are, are fighting for right now. Although they too also have their own equal measure of, um, of scrutiny as far as, as allegations are concerned. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking here uh, about the thoughts on the 18th constitutional amendment and its impact on land reform. What are your thoughts? Uh, what are my thoughts on the impact of uh, land reform? Um, <sighs> Look, the Constitution does state that the land can be, uh, you know, transferred uh, and that compensation has to be paid, you know, for uh, the land. And what uh, the government at first tried to do was to introduce a willing buyer, willing seller uh, format where a, a, a reasonable, quote unquote, reasonable amount uh, would be agreed upon between the government and, and the seller. But that really wasn't very successful because the, the state at times ended up uh, you know, paying inflated prices for the land and trying to acquire it. And in other instances, you'd find that the landowners themselves were not willing uh, to, to sell the land or to let go of the land that they perhaps they themselves had inherited or um, they bought at an earlier time for, or perhaps pittance at, at, at the time. So there definitely has to be a redress uh, there definitely has to be, um, I, I believe, some sort of, of, of uh, redress for even those who have been working the land. I don't really believe it's fair to kick somebody off the land that they may have worked on and strip them of their livelihood. Uh, because mm -hmm. what happens to them then, 
I believe that African peoples need to have their lands reinstated, you know, to them, and then also been given the facilities as well as the education and the infrastructure to be able to work that land in a way that can be commercially viable for them as well as their, their communities. But I do believe in a, a fair exchange um, so that it's not one they're now re-oppressing another, uh, but mm -hmm. that it's an equitable exchange and that what was originally that of the African people gets reinstated uh, to them. But, and all the support measures that need to be there in order to capacitate them to succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, here's just an abstract question that just, just thinking out loud here. What makes it such a complex issue? So if I contrast with, you know, if you were just talking right now, I, I'm thinking about here locally, Bruce's Beach, right? So it's over in Manhattan Beach. Tommy, when you were here, we probably rolled through the that little area over there. But there was a section where the Bruce family, a Black family, owned it. And in those days, Black people went to the beach and they went to Bruce's Beach because this is where, you know, we had to go, right? And then white folks took it away from them. So now here we are 100 years later and the, you know, the county is saying, hey, you know, we're going to give the land back to the descendants of the Bruces. It's just done. We took it away from, I mean, they're acknowledging the wrong and saying we're going to give this back. Cut and dry. Okay. Well, not so cut and dry, but cut and dry. In your mind, what, why, I, I guess it's a little complex because I had a conversation with the white guy in South Africa who was explaining to me how African he was because his grandfather, his great grandfather, his great great grandfather were there. That's all he knew was Africa. And to take his land, their land, to give it back to the black folks was just crazy against his, you know, his lineage. Well, in your mind, what makes it so complex as an objective observer uh, for the people of South Africa? There just needs to be political will, Greg. Mm. You know, I, I think the political will needs to be there and the political will then needs to be exercised in action and not just rhetoric. And there's also a fine balance that I believe that, um, you know, government is trying to maintain in the sense that they also don't want to scare away all of their investors. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They also have to try and, and play a balancing act of how do we restore justice, how do we serve our people, and then also how do we not scare off uh, investors who are going to be you know, part of our economic redevelopment and economic growth. So I, I think that's where perhaps some of the challenges are in, mm -hmm. in not being um, as robust and uh, expediting the, the entire process, which is something that uh, the EFF is, is just saying, let's just restore the justice and let's just do what needs to be done. And, and I think the governing party is saying, let's, let's negotiate, let's talk, let's find a, a, a common meeting ground and let's move ahead. And I guess those type of challenges and those type of considerations have to be made if you don't have a willing a willing mm -hmm. seller, if mm -hmm. it's not somebody who, um, you know, is not necessarily wanting to leave that, that land. So I, I think those are some of the considerations that don't make it as cut and dry. But the truth is, uh, there has to be a restoration. There's got to be um, justice on, on all fronts. And that needs to be the, the eventual outcome of all of this. How similar is this to what happened with uh, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe? He was just like, okay, we're just going to take the land. Is this a similar proposition? Mm, not, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a similar um, you know, proposition. Or if it were, then it's perhaps cushioned not to mm -hmm. appear to be a similar mm -hmm. prop uh, proposition. Uh, but it certainly is the situation where the government doesn't want to find itself, I think, in that position where mm -hmm. it is literally evicting people uh, off, off of the land. And perhaps that's where the, the balance for them is trying not to find themselves in that in, in that situation. And then that then resulting in a, a mass exodus of, uh, of, of investors in, in the country 
uh, you know, so I think those are just some of the considerations that they are, pu are putting in place right now. As you but say, white folks they, would have you just, you know, have us say, hey, you know what, uh, take it or leave it, we have the land now. And I'm thinking about this all over the United States. Man, you could just sh see where they created these states by just taking land, taking land, wherever they have gone. And then now we're learning here over in Africa, wherever they have gone, they just take the land. And so now we're just supposed to forget about it all good, our bad. I mean, it and, can't and, be. And, and, it, and it just, it, it cannot be because that is a, a preposterous, uh, you know, proposition. Uh, it, it really is a preposterous proposition because the land belongs to the African people. That is the truth. The African people were dispossessed of that land. Um, but I guess our approaches are different in, in how we are choosing to deal with um, you know, these type of, 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 of relations. Uh, and I think those are just one of some of the problems and the challenges that the current government is finding um, it, itself in. Is it going to introduce the forced removal of, of white people, in, you know, on, on land that, that is... Uh, they did it to us. Them? They did what it to they, us. What, what, will, what, will, what will they do? You know, that, yeah. those are the choices. And then how do they then... Uh, manage the, the repercussions of that. I want to put this in perspective for folks, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. in South Africa, you know, uh, democratic government came in 1994. Not too long ago, right? And so when we went to, um, when we went to uh, Cape Town and we were in District 6, and you can see the forced removals there. I mean, People, my brothers and sisters over here in America, you would not believe it. You know, government decides they want to use the land and they just bulldoze people's houses. And you literally see the vacant lots. You see people standing at where their parents' home used to be still to this day, mourning that, you know, this used to be my home, you know, and the, the government took it. It's the audacity of when we talk about dismantling white supremacy, uh, we, you know, systems, systemic racism all across the globe. You see these horrific situations where they just, you know, you use the, the term forced removals, get them out of here. And here in America, you have similar stories over in South Africa, all over the continent, wherever we are, they have come and just said, OK, move over. Get out of the way. This is where we're going to be. And so we're saying, give the land back. And I guess we're, we're also saying, how do we give the land back? And, and I think what's what's important here is is to look at the, the journey that the land restitution process has gone. Um, it used to be a judicial process. Uh, mm. And from that judicial process, it was then uh, moved from a judicial process to one where the Minister of, of Land Reforms and, and Land Reform was given then the power to take it out of the courts. There was a huge backlog um, as far as the, the restitution is concerned. And so the Minister of, of, land, of, uh, of land Affairs and Reform was given then mm. that mandate to effect restitution through negotiation. So those are the two tactics. First, it was a judicial approach, which really has not worked. And then now it's the negotiation approach that they're taking. Another situation, Greg, that you alluded to there is in South Africa, there are large numbers of people who will go and create and build their own structures in land that is fallen, land that is, that is barren, whether it's owned by uh, the council or government or it's owned privately, and they will build their own corrugated iron homes there. And mm -hmm. this is a, as a direct result of the shortage of, of housing in the country, but also the shortage of people who really don't have jobs and can't afford any sort of decent housing. So, so what really what you are talking about is the situation where government then does identify a piece of land that belongs to them, but a whole community has lived on that land. The whole community has built um, a life for themselves there. All of their belongings are there. And then government then coming through bulldozing all of those, um, you know, properties, and then saying, well, you were not supposed to be here in the first place. 
um, this land belongs to the state. And you'll find that the people who are living there probably bought the land from um, somebody who was perhaps representing the council or somebody who said that they had the mandate to sell that land. And so they didn't settle there for free. They actually paid some money to somebody. So mm -hmm. that also is in itself a, a thriving you know, syndicate business of its own where people are illegitimately selling um, government land to those who perhaps don't know better about how the land acquisition process really works and you know how do you get your title deed how do you buy land where do you buy land who do you buy land from um and and, and so there's also got to be a, a, a large level of education to a large number of the people so that they don't find themselves in positions where they are being taken a ride for because they are in a desperate situation and because they are in need but that mm -hmm. also then uh, puts the responsibility on, on government to build more uh, houses because there are low cost housings and social housing that government mm -hmm. does provide. Um, and so the backlog for that is, is also in, incredibly huge. Mm -hmm. Tommy Angabani, before we get out of here, what is the blessed hope for the country? What do you see? What do you hope the next um, you know, what's the blessed hope? What do we want? You know, Greg, I'd say that every catastrophe and every situation of chaos has inbuilt within it um, the seed of opportunity and the seed of hope. My prayer for South Africa is that this moment of transition that we are in is not an opportunity that will be let go of, that will be lost, and that will be overshadowed by other things. Um, I think it's an opportunity for a huge shift in the gear, just as far as uh, focus on poverty, focus on inequality, um, focus on uh, creation of jobs, uh, focus on restoring faith and trust and integrity in government, in structures, in the judiciary. Um, and, and what we saw as well, Greg, is in as much as there was a week of looting, a couple of days of, of looting, it is the communities themselves, Greg, who came back to those very malls that had been looted and some buildings burnt with their own brooms and their own dustpans and their own plastic bags to clean up the mess that had been made. So there are a group of people who say, yes, we see the rioting. We don't, we don't uh, agree with violence, but we do understand hmm. why they reacted that way or why they would do that. We don't agree with it, but we understand why. And a group of communities and people who says, this is not something that is going to reflect who we are as a people that we are not a people that is chaotic. We are not a nation of plungers. We are not a nation of looters. We want jobs. We want opportunities for education. Uh, you know the Fees Must Fall movement. The university uh, students are saying, well, how can we afford to pay school fees for university when our parents are working as domestic workers, when they hardly get a living wage? Um, and, and so all of these um, uh, events are really very much interrelated. One cannot um, isolate them and say this is the one cause. When we look at South Africa and we look at the challenges that the country is facing, we need to look at it from an aerial view and get a, a, a clearer perspective of the exact dynamics that have caused this. You know, mm -hmm. may this be an opportunity for the ruling party to regroup um, and to you know take responsibility. Uh, which in many instances they have vocalized, they've verbalized it, but you know we need to take responsibility by seeing you act on issues of corruption. We need to have people convicted. We need mm -hmm. to have monies paid back. And some of those monies have actually been paid back. We've got huge uh, corporates like McKinsey, for example, who mm -hmm. have paid back um, you know, the millions that they, they siphoned off uh, from the, uh, some of the state-owned entities and enterprises. We need to see that type of restitution. So in as much as things may look like they're falling apart, it is also an opportunity. And we can also see it as things 
coming together. Because mm. how can you start even addressing the real issues and the real problems of a people and a nation when they're swept under the carpet? Let it all out. Let's see what the truth is. Then we know what the truth is that we're dealing with. And then let's address those issues, knowing that they can actually be overcome and they can be addressed. There's a huge sense of hope in, in, in South Africans and, and, and a spirit that is just so resolute that even in these circumstances, there is still hope to say it's not over for us. We are still the people of Madiba. We are still the, the, the people of, of Mandela. You know, we are still a people of, of, of hope. And this is our land. There's no place that anyone's going to go and emigrate to. There's no place that you can call home other than, than this, the land of your birth. And so we've got to stick it out and we've got to all contribute towards building the kind of country that we want to live in, but also building the kind of country that we want to hand over to our children and for next generations to come. And that spirit is still there. There isn't, um, you know, this pervasive sense of, of hopelessness. I think there is despair in many quarters. Unemployment is rife, uh, but the hope still is there. Um, and also it helps to have a very vibrant uh, political landscape where it's not just one party, but it's a competitive uh, multi-party system where the people can actually have choices and there's freedom of speech. You hear dissenting and, and divergent views and, and policies, and then you can decide who you want to vote for. And as long as you still have your vote and you exercise that right to vote, then you can make a change. But if we are just going to sit back and observe and not be part of the solution, then I guess then we are part of the problem if we are not part of that solution. So we'll see with the local government elections that are supposed to have taken place in October. There has been a recommendation that they be moved to uh, next February uh, for, and, and this really because of COVID-19. Uh, parties cannot go out and campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. They can't really engage their voters, etc. So we'll see if there is going to be um, a good voter turnout. We'll see what the voting choices are going to be, who are people going to choose to lead them in, in local government. And that then, I guess, is also just an indicator for the national elections when, when, they, when they do happen. But my parting shot, uh, Greg, is that even in the midst of the darkness, the light still shines. Um, it's, it's not over. Uh, it's certainly an uphill, and we need to acknowledge that. It's certainly a dark period, and we need to acknowledge that. But we must also acknowledge that um, there, there are solutions. They must be applied. But the solutions are there. All right. There you have it, y'all. Thank you so much, Tommy Angubani, my friend. Yes. Giving us great perspective, you know. Uh, and I can't help but think, you know, yo, a lot of this that you're saying is very, very famil familiar. It's the parallels are almost identical. You know, uh, you got to get out to vote. If you are not participating, then you are part of the problem. Isn't that something? That's the same thing here. It's uh, all right. When can I, when do, when can I come back over? Because uh, I, I was trying to look at 2022, but uh, hey, I don't know. COVID's got us a little scared. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, um, I, I, I noticed the other day, Greg, that um, there, there's a biovac that's going to be manufacturing, they've, they've partnered with um, Pfizer and BioNTech, will be manufacturing vaccines here in uh, a plant in, in South Africa. And they're going to be manufacturing at least for the next two years. And when mm. they made this announcement, my first thought was, wow, okay, so I guess we are planning long term now, as far as COVID is, is concerned. You know, so we'll we'll see when when all of this ends. Uh, but let the vaccination drives continue for those who um, are basically interested in participating. But let me ask you, Greg, how has how has the vaccine uh, attitude been in in the United States as far as uh, vaccine take up? Well, you know, now you're hearing a, a heavy campaign. Of, I mean, the majority of the information is targeting the people who have not been vac vaccinated. And um, um, I can't re remember the numbers, but um, there are quite a few people who have not been vaccinated, and now they're targeting them. They're saying that the resurgent in re the resurgence in recent weeks and months. Um, the director of the CDC called it a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and so mm -hmm. everywhere you turn. 
is they're telling you, you know, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. They're showing people who are very, very ill. They're interviewing them on their hospital bed and they're saying, you know, hey, will you get vaccinated now? And the person can hardly be, yes, I'll get vaccinated. Honestly, Tommy, I don't know if this is just propaganda or what, you know, are they really, is it really that bad out there? I don't know. I got vaccinated. It's all good, but I went in kicking and screaming. So <laughs> I did not want to get it, you know, but I, I listened to a lot of, you know, black medical professionals and everything. And finally, albeit reluctantly went on and got my vaccination. Uh, it's just, um, but I don't know. I don't know what this, I, something is up. I don't know in my spirit, something is up with these powers that be that are, are making us get vaccinated. Now, on the other hand, the unvaccinated are beginning to take to the streets and have protests and everything. I saw as I was on my way here to Dream Creator Studio to connect with, 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 with you, I saw an article where a restaurant had a sign, you know, now the restaurants have a sign, oh, you have to be vaccinated or you have to wear the mask. This restaurant was saying, we're only letting the unvaccinated in as mm -hmm. a protest, you know? So the people are, are really, 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 um, it, it's just a lot, it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. We do know, Rhonda Love is saying, we do know COVID is real, that is for sure, because we lose the people out here. You know, it's very, very serious all across the globe. I just don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. mm, no, it's it certainly, I mean, it's certainly real. It's certainly here. And, you know, we've known so many people mm -hmm. who have died due to, to COVID-19. Um, and as I said, the vaccination drive is, is, is expanding. Um, I, I must say, though, obviously, with the protests that took place about two weeks ago, that entire vaccination uh, process was stopped. There was just no vaccination for a few more days, but it's picked up once again. And we've got over 2.31 million people who've already been vaccinated. Percentage-wise, that's still actually quite low. Um, it's just under 4% of the entire population. Um, mm -hmm. But it is picking up and those structures are being put in place. And there are partners um, that uh, the Department of Health has partnered with as well. Uh, like you know, Discovery Health and 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 the private sector to assist in the vaccination drives. So mm -hmm. that should mm -hmm. that should pick up. It's 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 got hope. It's it's not as um, you know disastrous really as 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 one would say. I think we can definitely be doing better, but the streets are not strewn with 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 with, with corpses. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have lost too many people. We've lost too mm -hmm. many people. Um, and yeah, indeed, Rhonda. It, it is real. It's here. Mm -hmm. We see it. Mm -hmm. We feel it. Mm -hmm. Well, they have a coffee conversations with Greg J. Hey, if you missed any part of this, y'all can go ahead and get on our Facebook page, Coffee Conversations with Greg J. Get it on demand at BeachCityRadio.com. A little later on, we're going to release the audio only version. You can get it wherever you get your favorite podcast. I'm talking iHeart, Apple, Google, Spreaker, Stitcher. Wherever, wherever you get your favorite podcast, just Google it. Coffee Conversations with Greg J. Tommy and Gabani, you're the best. You know, we have to, you know, you've uncovered some things here. And I really need to have another conversation with you, have you come back on so we can talk about, you know, business opportunities because I just believe, you know what, this can help stimulate. I think that now we're in a state of cultural revolution. So if Black people in America, we're now kind of bucking the system, if you will, but we also have to remain to think global. And we know our brothers and sisters over there in Africa, we know we have bit with, there's business opportunities. How do we link up and have business opportunities? What opportunities are there? How can we take our collective, they say in trillions, we have trillions of dollars in our community. How can we direct some of those trillions over to our, uh, to our brothers and sisters over on the continent because we are overturning systemic racism. That means the economic systems too. And so how do we do that? I know we're doing our part. We're importing coffee from Cameroon, West Africa. That's what we're doing. You know, we want to get down there. Some of those mines, I need to get some of that gold over there. <laughs> 
get get some of the diamonds, get some of the stones. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. But, but Greg, we certainly need to do that. Um, we need to do that. There was an organization. Um, I don't know if it, it still exists, but it was called Recycling Black Dollars. In, oh, in, yes, in, Muhammad Nasruddin. Yes, my good Muhammad friend. Muhammad Nasruddin. Yes, Muhammad Nasruddin, Recycling Black Dollars. And that was his whole, uh, you, you know, ethos, recycling uh, the black dollar. So we really need to do that. And and perhaps we can look at different industries where, uh, you, you know, we can meaningfully be able to participate because the opportunities are there, but there needs to be clear intent to pursue them um, and, and clear intent to, to make sure that the available structures are utilized and then also then to lobby for the gaps to be filled wherever it is that they may be. But uh, it needs first and foremost intent. <laughs> All right, y'all. There you have it. Damien Gubaini. Hey, what is that? Uh, news, what's it called? Newsroom Africa. You can Google it. It's on YouTube. Every guy. And news is spelled N-E-W-Z. Newsroom okay. Africa. News and uh, watch our sister do her thing. She is the one. Uh, our friend uh, Luke Angel, who uh, coordinates our tours over there, he uh, called me up on WhatsApp. He said, man, I'm watching Tommy and Gubetti. He's on like straight 48 hours. You know, this is where he was getting his news from you on when everything was going on there. You know, that's good. Look, there's a lot going on. A yes. lot going on. But Greg, it, it, it's always so awesome talking to you. And thank you for um, you know, the great team and everybody. We've, I've been reading through some of the um, of the messages as well. Kevin mm. Souls, a uh, lot of interaction. Dream Creator, Rhonda Love. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. I look forward to joining you once again. It, it will be great to talk uh, to talk business there. And there's also Pat Munson there. Yes, yes. I think you might have met Pat when you came uh, when you came over to uh, when you met us on Soweto that time. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Good, yeah. good. <laughs> All right, y'all. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. Peace and blessings.